name, point chapter, of pronoun. Privilege. Point of personal privilege. Yes. Please do not use gendered language to, to address everyone. Okay. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about political correctness and some of the issues I have with it. I'm going to talk about its effect on comedy. I'm going to talk about the First Amendment and free speech. I'm going to talk about the euphemism treadmill and just a whole bunch of little ways of why political correctness doesn't solve anything. And of course, to start out a video like this, we should begin with defining political correctness. On Wikipedia, political correctness is defined as a term used to describe language, policies, or measures that are intended to avoid offense or disadvantage to members of a particular group in society. Society. In public discourse and the media, the term is generally used as a pejorative with an implication that these policies are excessive or unwarranted. And it seems like since the beginning of the term political correctness, it's mainly been used as a joke, as a sort of way to poke fun at people who are just too orthodox in their ideology. In the way we know the term now, it seems like its origins lie in the 1940s, where socialists would use it as an insult against communists who they felt were putting the party line above compassion or rationality or the truth. They were just too diehard for their political cause that they were only acting politically correct. And then in the 1970s and 80s, it was used ironically by the left to make fun of themselves within, say, the feminist movement, for example, basically making fun of themselves for being too orthodox or to make fun of each other if one of them gets a little bit too high and mighty in their own regime. It also has to do with a lot of speech codes that were being invented on college campuses in the 90s, of which there have been over 70 lawsuits against them. Most of these speech codes were very vague, like do not use words that offend people People or don't send angry emails and obviously that's unconstitutional which I'll get into later and you just can't do that but I think in today's day and age it's best associated with the cancel culture that we see going on and a lot of you know censorship of language or beliefs that are not politically correct and just the kind of over censorship and hypersensitivity that we have going on in the world right now and of course the culture wars are insane right now as well and so it's just kind of a dicey topic but today I'm gonna get into a bunch of reasons why why I hate it. What I also think the main tenets of political correctness are is just the belief that changing language will change people's intent or changing language will reduce people being offended or causing suffering and just the idea that language should be changed to protect people's feelings and of course political correctness and cancel culture and all of that is very prone to concept creep. What starts as a few words or phrases that are deemed offensive and unsayable grow and grow until basically everything is offensive. I also see this recent belief of words being dangerous or words being violent or offensive as another aspect of coddling. If you haven't seen my last video on extended adolescence, I talk about this extensively, but I'm also gonna get into the coddling aspect of it later on in the video. And then also, of course, as we know today, even people's tweets from 10 years ago are held to today's politically correct standards and chastised and the whole thing is just kind of ridiculous. I feel like it's kind of at a boiling point right now, but that's also not to say that people don't blame political correctness for things that aren't political correctness's fault. I'm gonna link down below a skit that Ryan Long did about PC culture and how people will blame it even when it's not at fault. For instance, in that skit, uh, the dude gets fired because he calls his boss like a fat bitch or something and he blames it all on PC culture and oversensitivity when it's like, no, obviously you're gonna get fired if you call your boss a fat bitch. And while I'm talking, I'm doing the Chinese eyes because she's Chinese. Comedy. Exactly. And now I'm out of a job because she's triggered. So there definitely are people who, you know, blame political correctness as a scapegoat for everything. But I'm going to be talking about some specific instances and specific consequences of political correctness and PC culture. So this first section is going to be a little bit general, just the main reasons PC culture bothers me. And honestly, this can be summed up with one quote from George H.W. Bush at the 1991 University of Michigan commencement speech. I'll link the whole speech down below because it's just so spot on to today's times, but the main gist of it can be summed up in this quote, which is, The notion of political correctness has ignited controversy across the land, and although the movement arises from the laudable desire to sweep away the debris of racism and sexism and hatred, it replaces old prejudice with new ones. It declares certain topics off-limits, certain expression off-limits, even certain gestures off-limits. What began as a crusade for civility has soured into a cause of conflict and even censorship. And that's basically the main gripe with political correctness, is that it's an idea that has kind of a noble aim, if you consider it to be a noble aim, but put into practice, all it does is just censor free speech, it makes everyone uncomfortable and tense, it does absolutely no good for anyone. And what bothers me a lot about political correctness is that it completely ignores intent of what someone is saying. If someone's going off on a long speech or discussion and they happen to say a word that you deem offensive, and you just stop them and focus on that, 
and completely ignore everything else that they're saying, that's an issue. Political correctness also literally fixes nothing. Changing words doesn't change intent or behavior. Censoring speech doesn't get rid of people's ideas or behaviors. It's not the speech that's a problem, it's actions. And we all know, you know, the example of the alcoholic father who during the day is like nice and fine, but represses all of his feelings and anger. And then when he goes drinking at nighttime, he goes home and like beats his wife and kids. That's kind of like how I see political correctness as well because you could suppress speech and you could suppress ideas that you don't like hearing or discussions that you think are offensive or in poor taste or whatever, but if you censor all of that, it doesn't go away. It just comes back way worse. And oftentimes instead of just bad speech coming back at you after you try to suppress it, it's gonna be violence or worse. I also don't understand people who think that they're being activists by being keyboard warriors or digging up old tweets from 10 years ago. Like they think that they're actually doing something. If you actually spent that time doing like direct action or charity work or destigmatizing something or opening up a discussion or reading a goddamn book or something, so much more could get done. And I'm gonna be talking about the euphemism treadmill later on in this video. But another issue I have with political correctness is that it sugarcoats problems. For instance, changing homelessness to houselessness which happened sometime when I was in college and it just totally baffled me. Houselessness makes homelessness sound like it's not an issue, like not having a house, just like how you don't have a boat or a car or, or a toaster oven or something, like it just doesn't hit the same as homeless, which is what these people actually are. Like you could say home is where the heart is or whatever, but I would much rather be in like a studio apartment than underneath a bridge with like rats and heroin needles like scattered about. And I feel like a lot of these euphemisms and changing language to avoid uncomfortable truths to make them more palatable only harms the people that you are pretending to protect. You can say, oh, we say houseless so the homeless feel less bad about their situation and it helps them. Like, no, it doesn't. Like, it just makes you feel better because it makes you feel like it's not a real issue and that you don't have to do anything to help change it. And of course, George Carlin has his famous euphemisms routine, which I'll link below. But like I said, I'm gonna talk about this more extensively later on in the video. The other reason I hate political correctness is that it makes uh, topics taboo to talk about. It censors important political discussions. Within a dominant ideology, any divergence from the norm or any like you bring up anything that could be conflicting with this ideology's opinions and you're immediately shunned out that's what it seems like today on social media and all the politics of social media if you bring up any sort of claim to the contrary or even just question the motives of some kind of group and it's deemed politically incorrect, then you will just be shut down and it won't add to the greater discussion. We see this a lot right now too with the transgender movement. Like it seems like right now you can't even raise the question of whether or not it's fair for someone who was a biological male for most of their lives playing sports to transition into being a woman and just dominate girls sports in the Olympics. Otherwise you're automatically transphobic because it's not politically correct to even question it. Obviously if you think that there might be a difference biologically between someone who's transgender and someone who's not, you're a bigot. Even if Otherwise, you completely support, you know, equality for trans people and transgender rights and all of that. The fact of the matter is every political group has uncomfortable facts within it. Every ideology has conflict along the way. And if you just shut down all conversations around that, sometimes misinformation and lies can get hardened into orthodoxy to where it can't even be questioned. For instance, with the feminist wage gap thing, if you say anything other than it's solely because of patriarchy, if you bring up any other factors such as maternity leave or the types of jobs men take versus women take and so on, automatically you're just gonna be shunned from the conversation because there isn't room for more discussion. Things just have to be very black and white. And that's obviously an issue because there should be no topic that's off limits for discussion in my opinion. I definitely don't think that dissenting political views should be censored. When it comes to uncomfortable conversations, the key is discussion and arguments and convincing people through language rather than just censoring speech and thinking that will get rid of the problem or that if you have a question about something and you just person just says you're a horrible person for even asking it, then that's not actually gonna fix anything. And I think political correctness as a whole and especially you know how we see it today in cancel culture and so on, just adds to this general walking on eggshells feeling that people have. I have this, I don't know if you do, I, I feel like a lot of people do, where you're just afraid to say anything that anyone might disagree with because it's just gonna turn into a insane screaming match. Or you're just gonna be labeled a bigot or be doxxed or you know, like some crazy shit. Because I feel like everyone is so afraid to share any political view that isn't either extreme left or extreme right or in line with some kind of ideology because the political polarization in our country is so intense right now that people are just afraid to have conversations and I think that's a huge problem. I think it also kind of grooms people into having these rapid fire reactions to certain language or phrases or speech that they otherwise wouldn't have because it kind of just surpasses the, you know, searching for intent and understanding what someone's saying and just trains someone to be like, oh, they said this word and that's offensive and 
and then you just immediately jump onto them. It basically just kind of destroys critical thinking or just the way that we normally would think into where everyone now just seems to be reacting out of fear and vengeance and so on and so forth. Now I want to talk about political correctness's effect on comedy because I feel like this is the art form that is most under attack by PC culture. This is what Jerry Seinfeld was complaining about last week when he said college audiences just want to use these words. That's racist. That's sexist. That's prejudice. They don't even know what they're talking about. An opinion echoed by Chris Rock, who said he stopped playing colleges because of their unwillingness to offend anybody. And Larry the Cable Guy concurs. He said, it really is a shame that nobody can handle comedy anymore. You know, when Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, and Larry the Cable Guy <laughs> say you have a stick up your ass, <laughs> You don't have to wait for the x-rays to come back. <laughs> That's right, a black, a Jew, and a redneck walk onto a college campus, and they all can't wait to leave. So the thing about political correctness and comedy is that there are people who genuinely believe that there are things that people shouldn't joke about, that there are certain topics that are off limits. And this is an issue because if everyone, you know, censored speech they didn't like or said that you can't joke about something they are particularly offended by, if everyone had that right, there would be no speech or comedy whatsoever. Comedy is about helping us through bad times, being able to laugh at the horrors of humanity, being able to laugh at ourselves, being able to accept ourselves and rough things. And of course, when it comes to comedy, you can laugh at something about a dark topic and not be a bad person. In my opinion, comedy is a celebration of human faults. It's about owning up to what's wrong with us our darkest thoughts and intentions and so on and so forth and joking about them so we can all accept them when we otherwise wouldn't want to. You can't help what you find funny. You know, and when someone has a go at a comedian for being a bad person for making a joke, they've equally got to say, well, what about those 800,000 people that laughed? Surely they're just as guilty. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, well, and, and the laugh is... That's an, what hurts. an amazing register of, of the real opinions because it is involuntary. I mean, the, of the, course. The, the laugh, despite your best efforts not to laugh, too, is. Well, is, I get that. I say a joke and people go, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, the they correct, suddenly catch oh, themselves. Laugh, laugh correction, yeah. yeah. And I tell people, you know, you're allowed to laugh at bad things without being bad people. That's what humor's for. It gets us through bad stuff. If you can't joke about bad things, we don't need humor anymore. The thing that scares me the most about people who are like social justice warriors or like Twitter cancel people is that if you dedicate your life to tearing down faults in other people or your belief that what they're doing is wrong regardless of if it is or not, is that it makes it seem like you think that you're perfect because why would you tear down someone's Twitter from 10 years ago unless you thought you were a saint who has never made a mistake yourself? The thing about comedians, or at least a lot of the comedians I watch, is that they are able to joke about themselves, own up to their worst thoughts and ideas, and through that we're able to accept ourselves and our worst thoughts and ideas, and it doesn't mean condoning those thoughts or ideas. And the secret to being able to do this is knowing deep down that you're not a bad person. If a comedian knows deep down that they're not a bad person, they know that talking about a racist thought that they had or a crazy experience that they had isn't going to show that they are evil because they know that they're not. They know that instead they can use that as a tool for human connection because we all think bad things sometimes. But with cancel culture people, I'm just, I assume that they can't accept with their own human faults. These are generally the type of people who can't laugh at themselves, which are the people I avoid at all costs because they're the most tyrannical and in my opinion, most likely to act out in violence at some point. But if you're tearing everybody down for the like most minor social faux pas and pretending like you're perfect, like I'm scared of you. <laughs> Versus comedians who are comfortable enough to own up to these kinds of things because they know it doesn't define who they are. That's a lot better in my opinion. There are also a lot of conversations around dark humor. This is the same thing as thinking there's things that nobody can joke about. But the fact of the matter is the darker the topic, the more important it is to deal with and grapple with and comedy is a great way to do so. And of course you have the right to walk out of a comedy club or make a blog post about how you know, Dave Chappelle said something rude or whatever you want to do, but you don't have the right to censor other people's material, you don't have the right to censor speech, and you don't have the right to just demand that people conform to your own little sensitivities. And again, speech is not the issue, jokes are not the issue, it's actions that people take in the world that are the issue when it comes to things like discrimination or violence and so on. Censoring comics isn't gonna do anything good for the world, that's all I'm saying. And with that, let's get into the First Amendment and the recent concept of speech as violence. Some people think that because free speech could allow you to say awful things, that the concept of speech is the wrong thing. That's what's right. weird. Right. And, 
you need the only way you fight a horrible, hateful speech is nice speech proving the hateful speech wrong. That's you know if you if you curb free speech, it's a fun, it's an absolute fundamental right that all other rights rely on. Yeah, and it yeah. seems odd to me that people are willing to make exceptions, uh, and they come up with strange, nebulous terms like. Yeah, not hate speech. I want to go. Well, what's what? What? What's hate speech? Well, it, it turns out that hate speech is something that anyone d doesn't like. So the concept of hate speech is very nebulous. There is a dictionary definition, which I'll read to you right now. It says abusive or threatening speech or writing that expresses prejudice against a particular group, especially on the basis of race, religion, or sexual orientation. But the thing about hate speech, at least here in the United States, it's there's no legal definition for it. There's no exception to the First Amendment for hate speech. And so everyone kind of has a different idea of what that entails. And same as the idea that there are things no one should be joked about, everyone has a subjective view on what hate speech is, and if everyone's subjective view was allowed to become orthodox, literally there would be no speech left to say. You wouldn't even be able to make a chicken crossing the road joke because someone would be like, well, I had a pet chicken and it just died, so like that's offensive to me and you would just not be able to even say that. But the reason there's no hate speech law here in the United States is because that would be viewpoint discrimination. If you let a government decide what is or is not hate speech, that could be turned against anyone. And the fact of the matter is hate speech is subjective. And this isn't to say that there aren't exclusions to the First Amendment. For instance, if you're making an imminent threat of violence against a specific person or group, you're not protected by the First Amendment. Same for libel and slander, though people get away with that constantly. And as we've seen with that recent case of that girl who convinced the other guy to kill himself, you're also not allowed to incite someone to suicide. But hate speech, even, you know, for instance, the Westboro Baptist Church and their picketing things, that's all protected under the First Amendment. And this is a good thing, which I'm gonna get into. And even the ACLU, who obviously have defended LGBT rights and so on, also defended the rights for the KKK to organize and neo-Nazis because that's what freedom of speech entails. People have a right to protest and people have a right to speech. They don't have a right to violence. And the thing about free speech is that it only works if everyone has it. I'm gonna play a little clip from a podcast that I actually recommend listening to the whole thing of. It's only half an hour, which I'll leave down below, of Glenn Greenwald, who of course is most famous for releasing the NSA documents on behalf of Snowden. But before that, he was a First Amendment constitutional lawyer defending neo-Nazis' right to protest and so on, even though he's a gay Jew. And in this clip, he talks about why free speech has to be for everyone and people think that censoring speech is only going to help their politics when that is just definitely not the case so roll clip a lot of people who want to abridge free speech somehow convince themselves and i genuinely find it baffling but they somehow convince themselves that if they institutionalize a framework that says that certain ideas are going to be banished and people who express them will be punished that somehow the ideas that are prohibited and banished are always going to be the ones that they dislike. And it never seems to occur to them that they're really vulnerable once they institutionalize these, these, this, this framework that says certain ideas are, are to be banned and punished, um, that that can be turned around and used against them. And particularly if you're a minority, if you're you know, an LGBT citizen or a Latino or an African American, um, you're particularly vulnerable to having majorities say that your ideas are now off limits. You should be the last people who want to legitimize this idea that certain that majorities have the right to suppress ideas because it's certainly it's almost inevitable that that's going to be used against you, even if at the moment you think that that you're using it to your favor. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, when you suppress speech, it doesn't get rid of the ideas, it just makes them come back even harder. I feel like this is one of the reasons why Donald Trump got elected in 2016. Obviously the reasons for that are very multifaceted, but I think a huge driving force of why a lot of people felt relieved or refreshed by his presence is the whole he says whatever he wants thing. Even if you don't agree with the insane shit that he would say, the fact that he was saying it unafraid is like kind of a big deal in a culture where everyone is being silenced and suppressed and everyone's walking on eggshells all the time when it comes to what they're allowed to say. But even when it comes to offensive language, it should be out in the open where it can be discussed and engaged in and like actually argued against and like allow for understanding to happen rather than suppressing it and risking it resulting in violence. And at the very least, offensive language should be able to be out in the open because it will also help you know who to avoid if you're trying to avoid people like that. But now I'm going to be talking about the concept of speech as violence. There has been recent discussion or belief that speech can be violent, which is just absolutely insane. I'm going to be reading some quotes from some op-eds from UC Berkeley under the headline, 
Violence as Self-Defense, which came out after the Milo Yiannopoulos riots over at UC Berkeley in which Antifa and some Berkeley students literally beat protesters with batons and pepper sprayed people and set off fireworks and fires on the property in order to try to prevent a literal internet troll from speaking at their campus. And in these op-eds, these students are trying to justify their actions of violence by saying that <laughs> Milo Yiannopoulos' speech is violence. So a few choice quotes from that. To those who hate Yiannopoulos and the alt-right but have a hard time condoning black bloc tactics and property damage, I understand that these tactics are extreme. But when you consider everything that activists already tried, when mass call-ins, faculty and student objections, letter writing campaigns, numerous op-eds, union grievances and peaceful demonstrations don't work, when the nonviolent tactics have been exhausted, what is left? What's left is you gotta exercise your first amendment by writing your letters, doing your op-eds, showing up and protesting. Now the speaker gets to exercise his first amendment rights by doing his speech at your campus. And if you don't like it, well, number one, you could either go in and challenge his views and actually argue against the dude, or you could just ignore it and move on with your life and not show up. What you don't get to do is attack people because you don't like the person who's talking at your college. And this person says, these were not acts of violence. They were acts of self-defense. And to Yiannopoulos and all your friends who invited you and hosted you and defended your right to speak, I recommend you learn your lesson. Our shields are raised against you. No one will protect us, we will protect ourselves. And again, that is literally just justifying violence by saying it's a self-defense response to speech, which is ludicrous. And then this person, I guess, just loves to project because they say, there was no easy way to shut down the event and keep Yiannopoulos and his fans from inciting violence. So because his fans might incite violence, you get to incite violence first. That makes sense. And then this person, of course, engages in the classic black and white thinking, saying, If you condemn the actions that shut down Yiannopoulos' literal hate speech, you condone his presence, his actions, and his ideas. You care more about broken windows than broken bodies. As if language results in broken bodies. And also, that is just so not true. I don't agree. Listen, I haven't... I've never watched Milo Yiannopoulos stuff because I have better things to do with my life, but from what I've seen, it seems like I don't agree with basically anything he says. But just because I don't think that you should be able to censor someone else's speech because you don't like their ideas, and just because I don't think you could beat someone in the face with a baton because you don't like their ideas, means that I condone whoever it is that you're against. That's absolutely crazy. But basically, this moral panic around words as dangerous or violent Again, reminds me of coddling, it reminds me of an overprotective parent who is so hell-bent on making sure their kid experiences no suffering or no taboo topics or anything that might make them uncomfortable, that she just shuts her kid's ears, is gonna help the child when it's just gonna make them anxious, not self-reliant, not able to articulate their views, being afraid of other people's opinions or speech. It's literally teaching people to overreact to language, and if you genuinely view speech as violence, then that really limits the ways that you could respond. You're probably gonna feel morally justified in attacking someone like these protesters did, when that is obviously wrong. Like, I'm sorry, if you act out in violence in response to a political idea, even if you think it is very hateful, you're still the one in the wrong. But with that aside, I'm gonna get into the next section, which is on the euphemism treadmill. So Steven Pinker is the person who came up with the term of the euphemism treadmill and he talks about it saying people invent new polite words to refer to emotionally laden or distasteful things but the euphemism becomes tainted by association and a new one that must be found acquires its own negative connotations the euphemism treadmill shows that concepts not words are in charge give a concept a new name and the name becomes colored by the concept the concept does not become freshened by the name and so to do a kind of case study on the euphemism treadmill i'm going to focus on the word retarded which a lot of people have been trying to censor lately, even though it's actually just a product of the euphemism treadmill and it's just gonna continue going on like that, but I'm gonna get into that right now. So basically, before the word retarded was put into use in the medical community, it used to be idiot, imbecile, cretin, feeble-minded, and also moron. These all had specific medical definitions relating to IQ and disability, and it's very interesting that everyone can say idiot and moron now, and it's not offensive, but I'll get into that. One of the first medical associations regarding intellectual disability was called the Association of Medical Officers of American Institutions for Idiotic and Feeble-Minded Persons. But when people started using words like idiot, imbecile, and moron as slurs or as offensive out on the playground or in the real world, the association changed their name to the American Association on Mental Retardation. But then people started using retarded in the same way that they used imbecile and moron, and so they changed it again to the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And so obviously this relates to the euphemism treadmill because a word emerges describing some Thing. People then use it as an insult. 
the word changes, people just use that as an insult. The word changes, people use that as an insult, and there really is no end to this. I also think it's really interesting that there is so much emphasis on why you're not allowed to stay retarded when there are so many other ableist words that people use in daily life. Lame, that's someone who can't walk. Dumb, that's someone who can't speak. The word duh, like duh, that mimics people who have Down syndrome. Words with origins like this are literally endless and also just used in everyday conversation. And the thing is nobody thinks about where they come from and nobody associates, for instance, the word retarded with a retarded person or idiot with a retarded person or lame with someone who can't walk or dumb with someone who can't speak and so on or insane with someone who's like actually has a mental illness. Unless it's used in a specific context where that's clearly the meaning, it has taken on a new term because that's what languages do. They evolve over time. Did you know that gay used to mean happy. When I was growing up, it meant lame. And now it means a man who makes love to other men. When you call someone a douchebag, you don't actually think of the physical object a douchebag. No one thinks that. And also when it comes to banning words, it just gives them more power in my opinion. If you teach someone to be offended by a word, they're gonna be offended by it. But if you teach them not to, and they understand that it has nothing to do with them personally, it's not gonna be like that. I watched a video recently of this person who was calling out another YouTuber for using the word retarded on a Twitch stream or something. Like literally they made an entire video about this. And the person spent the first half of the video talking about how they have ADHD and retard is a word, is a slur used against people with ADHD, which first of all is not even true. But what made me so curious about that video is the fact that someone would expand the definition of a word so that way they could feel justifiably offended, so that way they could feel justified in censoring somebody else. And it's also especially ridiculous in this case because if you look at what retarded actually means, it means slow versus ADHD, which means hyper. So ADHD in a sense is kind of the opposite of being retarded. But of course in this video, this person acts like they're so offended and appalled and oh my God, like how can you, how can you use this term? But when you look at the history of this word, you'll realize that it's just been like this since the very beginning. But again, when I talk about how political correctness doesn't change intent or ideas, if you're gonna wage a war when it comes to language related to intellectual disabilities, the issue is isn't the term because that's always going to change. There's always going to be a new one that people are going to use. The issue that you should be concerned with is that people insult other people based on their intelligence, which personally I don't think is ever going to go away. I've never met anyone in my life who has not called somebody else dumb or stupid. It's just something it seems like everybody does from time to time. But soon enough, retarded is going to have absolutely no connection to Down syndrome, just like idiot and imbecile and moron no longer do, especially because that word has recently been banned from medical language as of, I think, 2010, Rose's Law. And this, of course, caused a lot of uproar. I'm gonna read a small quote from someone whose daughter has Down syndrome, sharing her opinion on the law change. When I first heard noise about officially switching the accepted term from mentally retarded to intellectually disabled or cognitively disabled, I balked. I thought the Arizona legislature's time and money could be better spent creating and funding programs for these often neglected people rather than debating what to call them. And I actually liked and continue to like the term mentally retarded. I think it does a better job than the others of describing what the situation is. In some ways, Sophie is slower than the rest of us in our house. I can live with that more easily than intellectually disabled. I don't like either of those words. She also talks about how in 10 years time, the playground insult is gonna be COG, short for cognitively disabled or something like that, because again, you're not gonna stop this. And then an article I definitely recommend reading that talks about this in depth is called The Rise and Fall of Mentally Retarded, which is by another parent who has a kid with Down syndrome. And he talks about Rose's Law and how now that retarded literally is not being used as a medical term for people who have Down syndrome. That also kind of makes it you know, fair use for being used as a synonym for stupid or moron or idiot and all these other words that have fallen out of medical terminology. He states, By declaring the word an insult and also no longer an official term, the community set up a circular argument. If mental retardation is no longer an official or acceptable term for a specific group of people, how does using it as an insult against those who aren't in that group denigrate those who are? Like idiot, moron, and imbecile, retarded is no longer an official term. It is merely an insult on par with stupid. It doesn't officially refer to any group, and so it doesn't denigrate any group. The previous link between insult and official term will fade from memory, as with idiot. One way or the other, by choosing to abandon the official term, the community gives up the right to be offended by it. They don't own the word anymore. Instead, we will have to go through this process all over again with a new term. In this article, he also talks about what he feels like the solution to this euphemism treadmill and never ending cycle is, which is basically reclaiming the word. The only reason retarded is even offensive is because people associate retarded people with being shameful. It's in the same way that the word fat is only offensive because people associate shame with being fat. If you're a fat person and someone calls you fat, even if they mean it as an insult, 
if you have no shame about being fat, you're literally not gonna care. Because the fact of the matter is, words only have the power that you give them. But then also, of course, no one would actually insult someone with Down syndrome for being stupid. But I use that as a specific example because I just think it's bizarre how people think that censoring this word is gonna change something and how come all of a sudden this word is under attack and it seems like it's changing all the time what it is. But language is very flexible and it changes all the time. And there are a lot of words that are based in, you know, sexist stereotypes, ableism, all that kind of thing that are no longer associated with those things and no one has an issue with people using it. And there's so much emphasis on people trying to censor words like retarded when so much of that energy could go into actually making real change destigmatizing disability, changing healthcare, creating programs like art programs and so on for people. There's so much that could actually be done, but instead people are focusing on such arbitrary matters and putting themselves in opposition to literally the most minor social faux pas. And ultimately it just doesn't do anyone any good. And I'm also not trying to say that words don't matter or that words don't affect how we frame things because they do, but there's a difference between words falling out of the norm naturally or words changing a meaning to where they no longer mean the offensive thing they used to and someone trying to force that change and censor people. And of course, like I've said, it's intent that matters the most. Unless someone is actually making fun of a disabled person for an intellectual disability, they probably aren't thinking about that when they say the word retarded. And if you are someone who gets offended by this kind of language, well, I have some optimistic hope for you when it comes to how things naturally progress. Think about the term snowflake. That has no orientation in gender or sexuality or anything like that. It's not an offensive term in that way. Whereas similar words in the past, like pussy or pansy, are. And so in that sense, you know, snowflake, like that's a pretty progressive word, you know, like we're really, we're making some progress. The only gendered slur I can think of recently is Karen, but anyone who works customer services know the vast majority of people who act like Karens are women. And if the shoe fits, you just got to wear it. But basically, Teaching people to be offended by really minor aspects of language does way more harm than good. I don't understand why teaching someone to be offended by language is a good idea. It really just adds to a culture of shame and anxiety and outrage and I just don't dig it. But in conclusion, most people seem to find political correctness to be a problem. I think most people believe it has gone too far. There are certain topics that are really important to talk about that people can't talk about there's really minor aspects of vocabulary and language that you can no longer say or else you're gonna lose your job or get censored or deplatformed. And people tend to overestimate how offended people are by things because the vast majority of tweets come from a very small minority of tweeters. And of course, when it comes to media and social media, the most outrageous comments get the most views and attention and that's what we all see. The things that are most uncomfortable are the things most important to deal with, whether it's through political discussion or comedy. And with everyone being afraid of saying anything, of expressing any opinions they have or making any jokes that they like because they feel like it's gonna be taken with the absolute worst intent possible all the time, they can either get repressed and bubble up in the worst way or more likely everyone just walks around just feeling kind of depressed and censored and cut off from the people around them because they don't even know what they're allowed to share about themselves. But anyway, that's my video. Those are just some thoughts I have about political correctness, some of the ways that it bothers me. I'm sure at this point everyone is either bored, annoyed, or irate. Let me know which one you are down below, or if you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up. I really appreciate it. Let me know what you agreed with and what you didn't. What is the worst part of political correctness for you? Do you think it's intense or good? Or do you think it's intense or malicious from the beginning? Anything you guys have on your mind, leave it down below. If you'd like to check out other videos on my channel, feel free, hit the subscribe button if you like this kind of content, and I will see you guys next time.